Hi, my name is Kelsey Schmitz, and I'm excited to welcome you to module four of our ISF West Coast Party series. Today's module focuses on leadership, ISF, and equity, and asking the question about our systems. Do they harm or help? And I'm joined today by Kurt Hatch from the Association of Washington uh, School Principals, Jessica Swain Bradway, the Executive Director of Northwest TBIS, and Susan Barrett from the Center for Social Behavioral Supports at Old Dominion University and the Center on PBIS. And as a brief disclaimer, uh, these opinions expressed are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS, SAMHSA for the uh, opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. I want to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington Smart Center and the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center acknowledge that we learn, live, and work on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people who walked here before us and those who still walk here. We are grateful to respectfully live and work on these lands with the Coast Salish and Native people who call this home. As you know, this series is um, jointly produced with the Pacific Southwest MHTTC, and they're led by the Center for Applied Research Solutions, which has offices across California in Sacramento, which is the land of the Nisanon people, Santa Rosa, the land of the eight Cahuilla bands, and Los Angeles, the land of the Tongva peoples. Cars acknowledges the belonging of this land to the indigenous people, named and the unrecognized tribes and people as well. I don't wanna take just a moment to tell you a little bit about the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. There are 10 regional centers across the United States. We know that those of you watching uh, this webinar might be joining us from all across the United States and want you to know that you have a regional center in your area that you are welcome to reach out to. And we're glad that you're joining us today. Today's session, again, is being uh, jointly sponsored by the Northwest MHTTC and the Pacific Southwest MHTTC. We also wanna bring your attention to um, two additional centers. One is the National American Indian and Alaska Native MHTTC, and the other is the National Hispanic and Latino MHTTC. And just a quick reminder about the acronyms and abbreviations that you might hear us use today in this session. Um, while we try not to use acronyms, um, it occasionally happens. And so we've created um, a guide for you that identifies um, a commonly used acronym or abbreviation in this work along uh, with the meaning. So please just take a moment to review this slide. And as a reminder, these webinars are building on some work um, that took place um, back in 2019 and 2020. Um, initially, three interconnected system framework fact sheets were created um, by Susan Barrett and the Pacific Southwest MHTTC. And then uh, we undertook a collaborative effort with our partners at the Pacific Southwest MHTTC to develop webinars that correspond to each of the fact sheets. And so that brings us to the series that we are doing this year. Again, uh, calling them our ISF West Coast Party webinars, Enhancing MTSS, Integrating School Mental Health and Wellness Through Systems, Data and Practices. So those of you who have been with us um, throughout uh, this series know that we have um, been taking the opportunity to first um, talk about ISF systems and then having um, a variety of um, speakers come and talk to us about uh, practices. So again, today's session is on ISF and equity, and we hope you will join us for additional sessions. We have taken all this information and created a web page. So as we are editing the videos and finalizing the PowerPoints, um, we are putting them all on um, a website and you can get to that by following uh, the bit.ly link that is um, located on the left side of your screen. 
Now I just want to take a moment um, to let you know about our three amazing uh, guest speakers today. I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to work on a regular basis um, with these individuals, and I'm really happy that uh, they are all three with us today. So we have Kurt Hatch, who's an Associate Director at the Association of Washington School Principals. Susan Barrett, Director uh, for the Center for Social Behavioral Supports at Old Dominion University and an implementer partner with the U.S. National Technical Assistance Center on PBIS. And Jessica Swain Bradway, who is the Executive Director for Northwest PBIS. And at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Jessica. Thank you very much, Kelsey. We're going to get kicked off with our um, learning objectives for today. Um, we're going to advance to the next slide. We've got a little bit of a delay on our interwebs today, so we're going to think everybody's going to be super patient. It's going to be wonderful. So here are our objectives. So we're going to um, talk about inequitable school systems and the impact um, educational inequities have on mental health and well-being. It's not a secret, but we're going to do some summarizing for you. We're going to talk about how the Interconnected Systems Framework, or ISF, which is, if you're just joining us, um, kind of a fancy acronym, not so fancy, for the explicit integration of mental health into positive behavior support. Susan Barrett is going to explain that a little bit more detail and how that promotes wellness and a healing approach. We're going to talk a little bit and share some resources around vulnerable decision points and neutralizing routines. Those are specific uh, data um, decision points and routines for teachers. And then we have a plethora of resources to walk us, uh, to help you advance your learning, continue your, your learning and um, have evidence-based resources at hand. We're gonna talk next a little bit about some self-care expectations. So this, uh, Susan Barrett, thanks so much for um, developing this slide and these reminders that as our stressors go up, we need to dose up our own self-care. So we've got some example self-care expectations for being safe, enga safe, engaged, and respectful as they apply to you and your day-to-day. Thinking about creating an emotional support team, I'm lucky enough to get to work with my emotional support teams on a day-to-day -day basis. Double check on your friends, asking for help. Um, if you feel a sense of hopelessness, we have a suicide hotline embedded in there for you, and that's something you keep handy for yourself, but also to share with others to try to normalize. Be aware of your stress um, and remember what we feed is what grows. So name the emotions we're experiencing, pay attention to joy, uh, recognize and validate that that grief um, so that you can begin to heal from, from that and do a body check for yourself. Take some movement breaks, hydrate, get your um, afternoon chai and be respectful to yourself by taking, um, taking the breaks, calming routines, healthy food and daily exercise. And those, that's a great way to get a break as well. But just some, some gentle reminders. We're going to move into, we're going to do a, a, a little meditation exercise as an example. Um, remember, we have no demands to ask of you. Um, we hope you can just come and absorb some information, share your wisdom in the chat pod. But this afternoon meditation is called, hold on, let me find my, my notes. <laughs> My brain isn't working, so I have notes to help me. Uh, this is adapted from five good minutes, 100 morning practices to help stay calm and focused by Jeff Brantley and Wendy Melestine. And it was introduced to me by Dr. Renee Van Norman, um, who is the lead educator for the Well Educator LLC. So take a get in a comfortable position. Um, if you're if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. You can gaze inward, or leave your eyes open and gaze at something um, in the room. I'm gonna leave my eyes open so I can read. But take a deep breath in and out, and let it go. So first, touching your thumb to your index finger. Travel back in time to a place. Uh, to a loving exchange with someone special. Um, so maybe reading a touching card, spending a, a moment having a connection with a human, a very positive comment, something that was um, positive and connecting with a human. So just take a moment and think about that time. Then touch your thumb to your index finger and try to recollect the most caring gesture that you ever received. So um, could be 
you know, something someone did for you, something someone said to you, but a caring gesture. Lastly, touch your thumb to your ring finger and travel back in your mind to a time um, where you were in, in a magnificent, beautiful, breathtaking place. In your brain, see it, smell it, feel it. Um, this activity can be used for kind of creating calm and mindfulness, grounding yourself as you move forward. And uh, we think after after three o'clock on a Tuesday back of our, after an extended weekend, it's a good place to be. Okay, we're going to move on to some resources for troubling times. We are all uh, full of emotions and we're pretty tired, all of us collectively. Um, and there's some mind reminders that we can have difficult conversations. We hope you can lean into your collective responsibilities, take care of each other. Um, it's okay for you to sit and talk with colleagues around what's going on and for kiddos and, and colleagues to express strong feelings. And uh, we want you to be really aware of how you create a safe space, who we're centering in those conversations, who has voice and agency in those conversations, and how our words impact others. So we want you to be aware of that. I uh, want to give you permission. I've said this before. I have no agency over your life. I'm giving you permission as a colleague in the work to take the time and space and create expectations to have these conversations about what's going on with uh, racial injustice, with political disruptions, with the, the stressors and uncertainties of the pandemic. We've included some resources uh, in, that are hyperlinked in this document to help you structure your conversations. And again, we want to encourage you to lean into the conversations. Stop not talking about it, create the space and the expectations for you to have the conversations as productively as possible. And with that being said, I am going to pass the baton to Kurt Hatch. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Kurt Hatch. I'm based out of Olympia, Washington, Washington State, and I'm an associate director with the Association of Washington School Principals. Um, I'm going to take myself off the camera just so my audio um, remains okay. And, um, but I just wanted to start by saying, this is a mission for AWSP, pretty simple. We're in this as a membership group for principals and we have two goals. So, and the, both of these goals um, are in line with a lot of what Jessica was just talking about and particularly in line with MHTTC and um, what you'll hear later from Jessica and our friend Susan Barrett. So we have two goals, um, Washington State, and it's to lead on diversity and equity issues for historically underserved populations and to reduce what we call the churn because only one in four principles, and this is a nationwide statistic, only one in four principles remain in the same building after five years. And we believe that the information that we're gonna share with you today is directly linked to that churn um, and it's also in principles are directly linked to um, the retention of teachers um, because teachers report that uh, principles are the number one reasons why they stay or leave their building. So one of my practices as a school and statewide leader is to share why I do this work when I present myself or present information just so people can be clear on kind of what they're getting and often because it connects me with so many other people um, like you on this um, <clears throat> webinar uh, with why we're doing this work. And so it's pretty simple for me. My whole goal is to lead with loving kindness in order to eradicate racism and unapologetically prioritize the education and well being of students, kept furthest away from educational justice. So my role is a vehicle for doing that work. And to do that, I have to spend time intentionally increasing my own racial literacy. And I bring that up because it'll come up um, on a number of the slides that I present today. because I wanna make some connections and through lines with systems work, systems leadership and racial literacy. So Sonia Douglas Hartford wrote an article um, called When Race Enters the Room. And she talks about the need for racial literacy, particularly for school leaders at being essential to the work of school leaders. And here's my motivation. So it comes from Dr. Ron 
Edmonds, who was a researcher and an educator. And he said, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. And we already know more than we need to do this. However, whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. So that's good news for us in our field, I believe. It inspires me every day. I read this quote every day um, to help me um, push through some of the challenges because we do know there's research, there's evidence-based practices, um, and we just have to keep pushing forward to get those practices into the hearts and minds of our students. And Dr. Ron Edmonds said that back in the 1970s. Okay, so today, the three, uh, one of the three things that I wanna to talk to you about is in red, system. So in with school leadership, some of you might know this, and I'm probably gonna be saying some things that just confirm what you already know, um, but it's uh, culture, systems, and learning. So school leaders and district leaders, those are really the three buckets or three pillars. And today I'm gonna to focus specifically on systems and in particular systems that we can maybe shift or uh, eliminate so we can make way for the things that Jessica and Susan talk to us about. So we do have some siloed systems, as you probably know, there's quite a few, and we have some decisions about what to do with those uh, silos. And because we really wanna turn them into high functioning systems. And just like in the human body, in schools, there's all these different ecologies or these different systems that as school leaders, we wanna be able to, or as community leaders or um, private organization leaders that impact kids, we wanna have a tight systems and interconnected framework so we can transcend these silos or these kind of special interest areas. And just like the human body, so on the left there, there's uh, 12 systems in the human body. And I wasn't sure about the one that's third to the top, the integumentary system. Um, that one's just your hair and nails and skin, things that protect you from things that might come into your body. So I was interested in that one. 12 systems, but they all function so well together. And so we wanna know how, what we can do to break down silos or eliminate silos. Or in this case, um, with the topic of learning loss, how to kind of protect ourselves from a new silo. Um, so this quote comes from John Ewing, who recently wrote an article. And John Ewing's a mathematician. He's currently serving as the president of Math for America. And he, he gave this quote in an article called The Ridiculousness of Learning Loss. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. It's very interesting. Um, and the quote really is talking about how the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but there, there are fires to be kindled. And we don't measure learning in months. And learning loss as a calculation, like on using test scores, is just masquerading as a concept. Um, that's rather, he calls it shallow, naive, and ridiculous. And for those of you that didn't know, Math for America, uh, which he's president of, is a New York City based fellowship program uh, for highly accomplished uh, teachers of math and science. But as, as you, you might have noticed, as the pandemic has continued to play out, learning loss has become a focus on education policy, and research firms have been publishing reports that cite. And seemingly with great precision, the number of months of learning loss. Uh, politicians are concerned about there being a lost generation and that whole, and the whole notion of learning loss drives all of this. And it's become really the central education feature for much of that pandemic. So I'm sure you're aware of this, but what Ewing's article prompts us to do is to ask, well, what does that even mean? What is like, what is five months of learning loss? What, what's lost? What is even lost? And do students forget? Do they forget facts? Do they forget skills? I mean, are memories erased? Um, and, can, and can we find what's lost? Um, and what does five months of learning even mean? So there's some assumptions here that we have not asked or answered. What are the assumptions? What's the data? Where's, this, where's these notions coming from? Um, but he points out, and here's the quote, that when people discuss learning loss, they generally don't know the answers to any of those questions. And so if the notion of learning loss is so vague, um, how can research firms so easily and precisely measure it? But what's happened in the process is these people are starting to create these systems to address 
learning loss, but we have to know where it comes from. Um, so when people are discussing learning loss, they, they don't know the answers to the questions that we're really asking. And it comes from the language of test companies and test enthusiasts, because for them, um, learning loss is like a, learning is like a substance that is poured into students over time. Now, a friend of mine, a friend and colleague of mine, Kelly Nichols, co-wrote an article that was published just last week and it's entitled, Getting Clearer, Schooling Loss is Not Learning Loss. And one of the things that Kelly reminds us of is that the narrative of learning loss is weaponizing static achievement against young people and families in ways that further harm them in a time of global pandemic and disarray. And, and we know that learning loss research is driven by deficit theory. So I wanna just pause for a second because deficit theory is really important for us to understand and especially through a systems lens. So what I'd like for us to do now is just think of a word or a, or a phrase that to you is the opposite of deficit, opposite of the word deficit. This isn't a quiz, it's just what comes to mind, a word or a phrase that to you, and maybe think of students, maybe picture a child or a student that you know well. So thank you. Okay, yes, you guys are ahead of me. Hang on a second, hang on a second. Hold on the chat. I wanna do something here. Thank you everybody, Ruth, Brad. Um, what I want us to do, I should have prompted this, is to hold on to the word or phrase because we're gonna do this waterfall thing. Maybe you've done this. I think it's so cool. We're gonna hold on to the word and in just a little bit, I'm gonna ask everybody to type it, but don't hit return yet. We're all gonna hit return at the same time and then it just kind of comes down as a waterfall. All right, so, but think of your word, your phrase, um, because we know that this research is driven by deficit theory, which is in and of itself a systems way of thinking that is harmful because deficit theory forces us to look at students and families through a deficit lens. So, and many of us might already know this, but just to overemphasize this point, deficit thinking emphasizes what young people can't do or families can't do rather than what they can do with meaningful learning, with meaningful learning goals and supports. And the thing about deficit theories is that they're usually expressions of racial bias more than they are objective statements of truth. So let's help each other change the way we look at things. So with the word or your phrase, go ahead, your word or phrase that's opposite of deficit. Put that in and then go ahead, everybody hit it. Yes, good, thank you. Awesome, openness, asset, abundance, strength, strengths-based. This is cool, plenty, thank you. Thank you, Lori, Ellen. Okay, so hopefully this is just a reminder that we can do this, surplus, yes. Thank you so much. All right. So just to be clear that deficit, okay, deficit thinking, it really defines the ways of speaking and knowing of youth of color as problems rather than their cultural historical practices that are just essential for ongoing deep learning. So words matter. Yes, I love the word abundance too. Thank you, Sierra. Okay, so we're on, we're on the right track now. Let's, let's keep going. Okay, so, and this might be obvious to some of you, um, thinking about mental health, um, social emotional learning, uh, positive behavior interventions, we shouldn't even be talking about learning loss right now anyways. That's almost just like a side note, but it's real. Okay, um, but we got to redefine the purpose and practice of education. Um, this came from an a article that Kelsey just sent me yesterday, and it was, it's right in line with what Kelsey and her um, colleague wrote, or excuse me, what Kelly wrote, and the Ewing article. So this is a point where we can redefine um, education in and of itself using mastery-based learning, right, competency-based learning, 
and strengths-based approach. Okay, so I just wanna come back to something. So I said this earlier, learning loss, is, uh, learning loss research is driven by a deficit theory. And that's typically has racial bias as a foundation. Now I showed the definition of racial literacy earlier because I wanna come back to this because it's really important that we understand the systems that are at work that drive things like learning loss and testing. Okay, so to help us clearly see how these systems have been working, um, an understanding of racial literacy is important. It's important for us to see below the surface of what's driving these conversations around learning loss. And it's attached to standardized testing. So there we see our deficit theory and racial literacy as being very important. We have to understand how race functions because it drives other conversations and systems. So we made these connections. We wanna remain focused on systems. And so I wanna tell you a story that brings all of this together. All right, so the story is, a, is about one person and it will end with two concrete steps we can all take to uh, address some systems, get rid of some silos and silo thinking to make way for what Jessica and Susan are going to offer. So stories about one person and it'll end with two concrete steps. To start the story, I'll introduce this gentleman, Dr. Lewis Terman. He was a PhD in psychology and taught at Stanford University, the Stanford University for 46 years until he passed away in 1956. So a long tenure of influence. And he became famous for the Stanford Binet IQ test. A lot of you might be familiar with the Stanford Binet IQ test. And it made both Dr. Terman and Stanford University very well known throughout the United States. However, um, Dr. Terman's particular interest in intelligence was not widely known. And when he started doing his research, um, intellect, being able to measure intellect was like the holy grail in psychology. If you could figure out a way to measure intellect, oh, you've done something just amazing. And he had a particular interest in trying to figure out how to measure intelligence. And it was, and this is well documented, his interest in intelligence was shaped, his interest in intelligence was deeply shaped by a belief uh, in what's called eugenics. So I'm pausing here for effect. Okay, you'll see the connections on the left. And many of you might know, eugenics is the study of how to arrange and limit reproduction within particular groups of society. Um, and the purpose is to increase the occurrence of like desired characteristics. So we're talking about engineering the human species. So Terman had a deep belief in that and it was connected to his pursuit of being able to measure intellectual capacity. And so for Terman, who was again, a widely regarded scientist at Stanford, intellectual capacity was in, for him, it was inherited and static and it could be quantified. So with this in mind, he devised the quantifiable scale of intelligence that included diagnostic labels. It was very official and it ranged from, here's some of the indicators from idiot to imbecile and labels such as moron to genius, all of which according to Terman and many of his contemporaries could be determined using a test. So one of Terman's contemporaries was Clarence Gamble. And he was a very prominent researcher at Harvard, at Harvard Medical School, extremely influential because he was also heir to the Procter and Gamble fortune. And he also promoted eugenics and was instrumental in the Stanford Binet test being used throughout the nation. Okay, so we're still going through this story here. And Terman and Gamble specifically used the Stanford Binet to present arguments of intellectual deficiencies in guess who? Indigenous, Mexican, and black communities specifically. And their argument for race-based eugenics became widely embraced. And they argued that, quote, significant, that there were significant racial differences 
in general intelligence and they introduced um, a scale in order to make the determinations. Okay, so there, this is their scale. Even Spock knows that's not logical. But this had deep systemic implications for people in real life and real time. And there is a connection directly to um, school, our school system. Um, so there's a little bit more to the story. So we've got very powerful people like Dr. Terman and Gamble, as well as powerful institutions like Stanford and Harvard, um, ensuring that IQ tests, testing is embedded into healthcare systems and what you're here in a second, judicial systems. And because of a belief in eugenics, <clears throat> the Stanford Binet became instrumental in justifying the use of sterilization, specifically for those labeled with an IQ under 70. That's where they made the determination. So now we're talking about real life eugenics happening. Um, I, this is a fascinating story. I won't do it justice, um, but you can uh, look this up and there's a great audio and a follow-up book by someone who interviewed um, Carrie Buck, who was on the right. Her mom is on the left. Carrie Buck also had a daughter. Um, and so there's a Supreme Court case of Carrie Buck that officially made for sterilization legal. And there's a connection to the Stanford Binet here. Um, okay, so... The case is known as Buck versus Bell, and it set a legal precedent for the sterilization of residents of public institutions, which Carrie, um, uh, Carrie Buck was forced to go into, even though there really wasn't anything wrong with her. She just had a terrible upbringing. And the court argued that, quote, imbecility, epilepsy, and feeble-mindedness are hereditary. So this is the Supreme Court of the United States and that residents of public institutions should be prevented from passing these uh, defects to the next generation. So with the Stanford Binet IQ test being used as evidence, as a primary piece of evidence, the Supreme Court ordered that Carrie Buck be sterilized. So subsequent to this uh, court decision, subsequent to this a uh, court decision over 60,000, yes, 60,000 people, 60,000 people across the nation were subjected to forced sterilization. Remember the connection to the Stanford Binet, it's continuing to be used. So for many eugenicists like Terman and Proctor, the Stanford Binet presented, finally presented a legal way to measure intellect in order to efficiently judge the worth of human lives. So and let's so let's fast forward to today, although that was not very long ago. So you see that fifth edition, these are the current classifications. Just change the words to be a little bit more palatable, but I can tell you it's only been a couple years since the words um, mentally retarded and severely mentally retarded were on that list. I've had the unfortunate experience and it's a regret of mine to be in the room with school psychs who felt terrible about showing those labels to their kids or to their families and pointing to something as though we're diagnosing them medically and saying, this is where your child has now been labeled permanently. And that's a deficit model clearly. So research now shows <laughs> that intelligence is dependent on many things. But unfortunately, the Stanford Binet and similar IQ tests are still commonly used in our schools, particularly in special education to label students and make decisions about their educational fate. So, <clears throat> I, you know, I, many of you may have experienced this. Um, yes, I see that, Cassie. Thank you. IQ tests are used to create profiles of students that label them with having learning disabilities, when in reality, they have many strengths, complex intellectual capabilities. And for the majority, um, they simply just need to be taught how to read. Most students enter in because of language, speech, learning pathology, etc. So as I mentioned before, this story was is about one person, not Terman, not Gamble. It's about Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck, who was only 17, when a test was used to officially label her as feeble-minded prior to being forcefully sterilized. 
I shared the story with the intention of elevating the voices of youth because she was only 17 and the marginalized. You know, students are the only ones who live the full effects of procedures and policies and curriculum in our schools. So their voices should be front and center. So have we asked students how they feel? How we have we asked students how they feel about the notion of learning loss or how they feel about the notion of deficit theory or measuring intelligence using a test? Okay, and I also had mentioned that there's two concrete steps that maybe that I'm gonna finish with leading into um, Susan and then Jessica. So they might be pretty obvious, <laughs> um, but here's the concrete steps that we can advocate for discontinuing the use of the Stanford Binet. We can remove learning loss, quote, learning loss from our vocabulary because it's one, it's not a thing and it's a distraction. And I think uh, pursuing it is like educational malpractice, but it also helps to reduce deficit thinking. And doing those two things is an indicator of racial literacy because we know um, the implications around race and racism. And so back to the beginning, it would also help break down harmful silos so they can be replaced with interconnected evidence-based systems like PBIS and ISF. So I hope this was helpful. And um, if you have any questions, I know we're gonna do Q and A later, but now I'm just really excited to turn it over to my friends and colleagues. I think Susan's next. Yes, thank you, Kurt. Um, wow, wow, thank you so much for setting um, this up for us this afternoon. I, I took a ton of notes and I um, am looking forward to learn a lot more about what you had to say because I really feel like it, um, it needs to be um, front and center as we um, kind of come back collectively from, from the multiple crises that we face right now. And so as you were speaking, I was thinking about you know, we're at a crossroads right now where we can use the multiple crises that we face to, to disrupt the status quo. Um, and, you know, we, we can either fixate on, quote, that, that falsehood of learning loss and fall into old patterns and continue to get the outcomes that we've unfortunately been getting for multiple decades, or we can choose a different path and we can put um, wellness at the center of that path um, and, and really start to take the time now to really examine the systems and, and explore for ourselves whether or not we've really inadvertently put up harmful systems. Um, and, um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, making sure that um, we were thinking about the structure that PBIS offers as a way forward. And so just to remind you, uh, I'm gonna just do a really brief overview on PBIS and ISF. And then um, if you wanna take a little bit of a deeper dive into this, we've got previous recorded sessions that will help you take a little bit of a deeper dive into the interconnected systems framework. But I'm gonna argue that even prior to COVID, we had launched um, a, a an effort called positive behavior intervention supports that many of you on this call um, are, are keenly aware of. It's the most scaled up in all of the human services industries. And I'm gonna argue that as a result of the randomized control trials that we did within PBIS, that that's actually a mental health initiative, right? The outcomes that we were able to secure through, through the uh, making sure that we were here adhering to fidelity, we actually saw uh, decreases in, in um, office discipline referrals and exclusionary practices. We saw increases in organizational health. Um, we saw so, so many cost benefit analysis come through. So that really set the stage for our work um, moving forward um, in, in making sure that uh, we knew that schools weren't gonna be able to do this alone. And, and even before COVID, we had a mental health crisis on our hands. And so um, our center invested in um, this and coined this term interconnected systems framework or ISF, where we are deliberately now using all of the lessons learned through our PBIS work and using that systems change phenomenon to deliberately apply 
community mental health and school mental health into the fabric of our PBIS system, right? So ISF is about that deliberate application. And we've um, been able to give a ton of resources on how to have teams effective, effectively go through that process of systems change. It's more specifically about aligning all of the social emotional behavior initiatives into one single system. And we really draw on this cascade of implementers to invest in a common way of work as we launch into disrupting the status quo and promising ourselves we'll never go back to the, the way things were because they weren't working for so many of our kids. We also wanted to highlight the fact that this is actively led by families and youth and community partners, and that we have um, deliberately um, changed our, our power dynamic and shift our power dynamics to make sure that we acknowledge that within every chair, there's a leader. And again, we've got family and students leading the charge, leading the work, leading the change for us as we move forward. So to take a little bit of a deeper dive into ISF, um, I wanted to give you the uh, official definition. Um, it is a structure and a process. It's customized to fit the core values of the community because it's being led by members of the community. And it's really about interacting in a much more effective and efficient way. And it's about making sure we invest in the prevention science. Um, we actually know exactly what to do. It's about, do we have the political will to change um, what we've been doing all these years because it was actually harming so many of our groups of, of um, and our populations of, of people that we serve. It's guided again by the community members, by key stakeholders, and we, may, we need to make sure we've got people who have the authority to make big systems changes there at the table, ready to make changes around funding, changes around policy, changes around specific roles and functions of staff. So for example, we know we need to hire more social emotional leaders, but we will not be able to hire our way out of this crisis. It will mean that we hire more people, but we change their role so that they help build capacity of everybody in the system to be charged with embedding social emotional and behavior supports right into the fabric of the academic community. So we hold those two things with equal priority. Um, so there's a lot of systems change work um, and we've provided a, a really clear, um, in our volume two monograph, we've um, provided really clear ways on, on making this happen through a series of uh, phases of implementation. I, as a way of um, just taking a little bit more of a, a lean into this, we are guided by four key messages. One is that we invest in a single set of teams um, that we don't inadvertently silo ourselves out and create a separate mental health team, that we pull it into our MTSS work and we design um, and bring our trauma-informed care, our suicide prevention, our policymakers into that single system and we design a single set of teams within that cascading model. Two, access is not enough, that our success is defined by our outcomes. And similar, similar to how we've created um, our our metrics for academic supports, we're gonna use that same logic to apply to social, emotional, behavior and mental health support. So uh, for example, we would never um, count the number of kids who are in our reading class and call that an outcome. Um, but so many times we count the number of kids who are receiving services um, and, uh, and call that acceptable. So how do we drill down and, and make sure that we are actually uh, using um, an instructional approach and teaching social emotional skills and making sure that everybody takes a role in ownership over teaching those strategy and skills and embedding them into every fabric of our community, including our content areas, our hallways, our communities and our neighborhoods and our family units so that everybody is really clear on what skills and strategies based on our core values we need to lift up and everybody needs, needs to pay attention to. So number three, mental health is for all. We all need social emotional supports to handle and navigate um, the stresses that life brings us. And we also share um, equal responsibility in, in making sure that that permeates the academic setting that we all find ourselves in. Um, and then the last one is the core features that we've established through our multi-tiered system of support are absolutely essential to install anything, including our wellness strategy, our school mental health strategy. 
So I wanted to um, leave you with a couple of big ideas, a couple of questions. Um, ISF is really about creating a human-centered system. It's about bringing critical partners into this work and asking ourselves, are our systems set up to inadvertently harm or are we actually helping? And so um, in what ways are school and community investing in a common way of work? Are we investing and learning and leaning into those core features? Are we eliminating uh, the cycle for disadvantaged families? Uh, too, uh, uh, too often, um, we've got, when we're looking at the systems across in our communities, we've got subpopulations, we've got people of color, our black and brown and migrant communities have differential access to housing and healthcare. And that permeates this ongoing um, uh, inequity that we find ourselves in in education. So how do we, uh, correct that, that course and how do we bring in other essential partners to make sure that when we're distributing our resources, we're doing it in a, in a very equitable way, um, that we are investing in a formal routine that shapes not only um, the, the routines that we have as a community and a team, but also my individual role that I have within the system. How am I operating and functioning differently? What's my individual charter and in disrupting the status quo? And finally, how do we describe to all of our stakeholders how this is different than anything we've done before? So I wanna leave you again with some questions to ask yourself as you take this information back to your community, back to the teams that you're working in. Um, are your resources, um, as you look and take that balcony view across the landscape within your neighborhood, within your community, distributed equitably? Look at your staffing ratios. Look at the way you distribute resources with respect to sports and the clubs that you offer, um, the transportation that you offer. Uh, do an equity walk and see what kind of physical building you have across your communities. Um, you know, what are the inequities in terms of some schools have air conditioning and heat and have resources to be able to conduct chemistry lab. Other schools in your system may not. How are you going to reallocate and just distribute those resources in a more equitable and fair way? Does your data system inform equitable decision-making at the local level, at your school level? Can you disaggregate by all subgroups as you look at that data? Not only uh, data that, that looks at where mistakes and errors are, occur are, are occurring, but also what strengths our students and our families are bringing to us. Um, and including, including uh, special education in that, in that data review and able to look at that on a regular basis and make real time quick decisions about rearranging the conditions um, rather than posing blame on our students for not being successful. Do your teams review community data to make adjustments? Um, do, are we waiting for kids to fail in our systems or are we looking at forecasting data around in our community that informs us about how we strengthen and support all so that first and foremost, we're meeting the vast majority of need before we invest in secondary and tertiary supports? Are we looking at an unintended side effects from policy and procedure decisions? To what extent are we consistently um, uh, implementing policy across the board? And do we have consistency procedural guides and are we holding ourselves again accountable first before assigning blame um, for our families and our students falling through the cracks? So what is your policy, your practice to policy, policy to practice feedback loop look like? And are we inadvertently harming our disadvantaged youth and families in that work? So you can see we're really trying to unpack all of the people the, the systems pieces and, and, and bringing it back together so that it, it, it is actually, um, we're actually invested in, in much more of a healing protocol. The other question around um, professional development and coaching, do you allow time for your staff um, to, to take new content and apply it into their everyday setting? Are we um, always training in, in teams so that we have an opportunity to bring that into our strategic plan and elevate it to have that priority status that it needs to have? And are we tracking fidelity? And again, I can't emphasize this enough for high quality of evidence-based practices that have, um, have demonstrated outcomes for the, the community and people we serve before we inadvertently um, uh, assign blame to students for not succeeding in the system that we've developed. And finally, are we investing in a co-response model so that when there are indications that, and our students are exhibiting behaviors and they're communicating to us that they, they need something else from us, that we are 
holding our safety protocols, right? Uh, and, and having those safety protocols uh, adhered to, to make sure that we're all staying safe, but we're looking at it from a mental health lens. And we bring our crisis response team and our mental health partners who can help us figure out um, the underlying um, issue of concern and that we have um, that we look at the strengths of, of the students that are coming to us uh, at the same time we're examining the skills and strategies that they need um, or re-examining the conditions that we need to reshape and we we have ownership of redoing um, as we redesign this this new systems change so in similar ways we're looking at our community partners and and when 911 calls are coming in they not only have police go but they have a crisis support team in the community similar when we have an office referral or when we're asking for help because of a safety consideration, we're bringing that mental health lens to make sure we're not inadvertently putting in those exclusionary practices that, that um, oftentimes harm our, our, our students of color. So here's some questions to start with as you're unpacking your, uh, your system and looking um, to, to the extent in which it's helpful or, or, or harming the students that we work with. And so this is your call to action. Um, we are at a crossroads again right now, and so as a team, are we going to um, go back into old patterns of doing business, or are we going to invest in disrupting the status quo? And with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica, who will take us through some really specific practices we can put into place um, starting uh, tomorrow. Jessica? Thank you, Susan. That was great. I love uh, the setup, Kurt, and, and these amazing reminders about the deficit model. Susan, you have such great uh, insights and, and bring this wealth of knowledge about restructuring our system. So we are not uber focused on a deficit model, but we're stepping back and looking at this from a multiplicity of perspectives. So I get I have a few slides here to talk us through about uh, some ways that we kind of protect ourselves, we protect others, uh, we protect our kiddos against uh, kind of our own uh, state of well-being in those moments that are difficult, um, and how we learn to can um, put some pieces in place to help us lean on using evidence-based practices. So a vulnerable decision points, and some of you are familiar with some of this research. I've got a little University of Oregon, or actually the PBIS National Center icon there at the bottom of the screen. Um, so kudos to that group for this, the research and work on this. Um, a vulnerable decision point is a decision particularly related to discipline in which we're much more likely to act, have a snap judgment and react out of uh, some implicit bias. And remember implicit bias is an over-reliance on stereotypes. It's how a lot of us have been conditioned and we all have some type of bias, right? Um, so we're more likely in that moment uh, to make a decision based on bias instead of Hmm, what's the evidence-based strategy I should use in this moment? Um, and we know from the national data that our more subjective problem behaviors defines disrespect, how we define major versus minor. Those more ambiguous behaviors and more ambiguous definitions are much where our vulnerable decision points are much more likely to show up. So these are the moments, the times, the behaviors, the students with whom we are less likely to take a deep breath and go with the second thought, right? We go with that first thought, thought instead of the second thought. Kelsey's gonna advance this in a moment. She's very good at this. Um, we can reflect on our vulnerable decision points. We actually can use our data. So someone said, hey, do we have, do you know, do we have measures? Do we know how to kind of examine this to make sure that we are being more equitable? Well, looking at the patterns of our vulnerable decision points collectively is a great place for us to say, are we leaning on evidence-based practices? Are we defaulting to a deficit model in which we've just accepted, you know, air quotes, those, those kiddos kind of thing, which I used to be a high school self-contained teacher. So people use the word those kiddos a lot about my kids. Also probably they use bad words too, but we won't say those on the webinar. But we can look at our vulnerable decision points collectively. So we can do that in reflection. We all have our cool pocket cameras, right? Pocket computers where we can record ourselves and look at when we're more and least likely to use evidence-based practices, that instructional model that is protective, right? That is dignified, that is not exclusionary. So I'm reteach, I'm adding practice, I'm providing additional feedback in an instructive manner. I'm using um, uh, behavior specific praise, right? I can record myself. When am I more and least likely? Um, we could have someone do a self come do a peer assessment of us to help us see that it's very hard to manage all of your kiddos and see what you're doing in real time, 
right? Um, we could also look at our part, our patterns of office discipline referrals. And this is one of the reasons we really lean on clean data, data that are reliable and valid. They measure what we want them to measure over and over again. So kind of the opposite of those air quote intelligence tests, right? But our office referrals, and remember that referrals are our behavior as teachers and how we are, um, are we writing those refer referrals or not. We can look at those patterns and look for those vulnerable points. Where are we less likely to rely on that reteaching approach? Where are we more likely to write a referral to send a kiddo to the office? The goal is that regardless of the behavior in front of us, we are responding with an evidence-based practice. And I always give a caveat that it's okay for us to regulate and then respond. It's okay for us to say, I need a moment. Uh, this mom of two kiddos has given myself some mommy timeouts to think about it before I respond. And I'm not, not perfect at it, but a try. So we can, we want to respond with evidence-based strategies and say, how have we created the conditions for this kiddo to be successful? And we want that to be our default, especially in these vulnerable decision points. And our systems help us have the strength collectively to do that, right? So we're moving ourselves systematically out of a deficit model. We're moving ourselves systematically towards being accountable for how our behaviors shape the environment to nurture that little human being in front of us, right? So we're thinking about that, how the conditions create wellness, or maybe they create harm. And we see too many instances of them creating harm. When we have, when we're in the face of a vulnerable decision point, we need an alternative. Um, and the stronger our systems are, the more robust we put those things in place for our grownups, right? Our professional development, that coaching feedback. We know we're being, um, the system is being developed with a strong voice and choice of family and community providers. So the stronger that is, the more li less likely we are to react out of our implicit bias. We don't make it go away completely. We're just trying to get better, right? Not perfect. So an instructional routine is, a neutralizing routine is an instructional routine. <clears throat> it's a best practice, right? Thank you, a little frog. Um, that is, is a response to unwanted behavior and it's in place of a harsher exclusionary or sh shaming response because those clip charts, they are shaming and they're not evidence-based. In fact, Jeff Sprague and I just finished a book about that. You can check it out soon. But it's a clear, do clear doable action that interrupts the chain of events and it keeps the kiddo involved in instruction. So it's dignified, we're gonna respond with teaching. And what I think is extremely important is that we think about these are strategies that allow us to work in alignment with our values as teachers. No mission statement from a district says we'll harm kids, but only when they really deserve it. No mission statement says only some of our kids deserve our best practices. So when we create the neutralizing routines, we've identified those vulnerable points. We create neutralizing routines. We're more likely to respond in an evidence with an evidence-based strategy. And we hold ourselves, I'm a warm demander, we hold ourselves warmly accountable for that by looking at our data and problem solving. That hyperlink at the bottom is a great overview, again, generated, uh, developed by the folks at the University of Oregon and the National Center who are doing work on this research. Let's show the next slide. We have some few critical features. What is it? What do I mean more specifically? What does a neutralizing routine look like? And then there are two examples for you. And then I'll be, I'll be wrapping it up. We're doing so great on time. So it's an if then, so you can create these if then statements. And these are not meant to be black and white. You're out of here. These are I'm going to practice in this moment. If a kiddo does this thing, then I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to do this thing. You know, I have this, I have this statement. It is brief, clear steps. It is doable. Okay. If your neutralizing routine includes 50 push-ups in the moment, you probably don't have the time to do that, but you're welcome to do that after work. And it interrupts the chain of events. Big chain of that event being what's internally going on with us being driven by stress, being driven by frustration, right? Um, so, and we're not, again, we're not going to be perfect and we're not gonna say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't use a neutral, neutralizing routine yesterday. We're gonna look at our data. We're gonna see how we're doing some reflection. We're gonna see how we can make it stronger collectively next time. So you understand why this, that we are leaning on the power of the systems and positive behavior support. Our next slide is two examples. 
of uh, neutralizing routines. Kelsey will get us advanced. So again, this comes from uh, thanks to Dr. Kate McIntosh and Owen Bastable and, and other folks doing this work. Um, the first example is TRY. So it's a T-R-Y. Dr. Mack loves acronyms if you don't know it. So take a deep breath, reflect on your emotions and ask yourself, is in this in the youth's best interest? I like to ask if, a, if it, did we help or harm the relationship? That's one of my kind of mantras to go to. And then we say things like, let's try that again. Let's try that in a different way. Or let's try how we do that at school, right? Because we know that there's situationally appropriate behavior. It's, beha it's appropriate somewhere else. It's not appropriate in school. And we want to respond with let's reteach. So we're doing what's appropriate in this school setting, this collective belonging, right? Let's try it here without devaluing situational appropriateness, the savvy, the gifts, the amazing problem solving skills that kids may use somewhere else that just don't work in school, right? So take a deep breath, reflect, is, is this in the youth's best interest? And then our two bullet points are examples of if then statements. Again, look at your those those difficult points in the day, the times of day, the behaviors, you know, you're much more likely to, to write a referral, get to that point, right? And then we back up and we examine the fidelity of our behaviors in that moment, right? Because intervention is adult behaviors in the school setting. The next slide is just a reminder of our go-to, our lean back is those evidence-based practices. And um we know that we don't all get the same setting in the school when we become teachers, right? We don't get the same training when we become teachers or become admin administrators. So we rely on robust professional development, coaching, and that feedback loop. So we want to teach and reteach, teach and reteach, and the difference between teaching and telling, right? We actually want to use best practices so we can look at the um, impact of those best practices. We remind kiddos, we prompt, we praise around, we use active supervision and proximity. We're looking to establish, maintain that relationship and sometimes repair that relationship. And some of you are familiar with EMR, establish, maintain, repair. We can lean on our neutralizing routines and work systematically as a grade level, as an entire you know, um, school, as an entire district. So we stop punishing the hurt we start stop harming our kids in the name of discipline or instruction and those are air quotes for those of you just listening in um, and we are applying our best practices so that we can lay the groundwork for that kid be, to be successful and we do need to we do a million percent we need to go all in on being committed to get rid of the systems and practices that harm our kids, or in this case, that ham our kids. <laughs> My kids are signing up if it's a practice that involves ham, but it should say harm. I just missed that one. We want to use replacement behaviors and get rid of the harming and shaming and the isolation behaviors. They are applied inequitably. They are damaging to our well-being, not just for the kiddo in front of us and their family, but also to our collective community as a school. Okay, so Kelsey, let's do our exit chat. We're doing really well on time. I would love to know before we open up to Q&A, and I appreciate the folks put questions in the Q&A pod. If you didn't, but you typed in the chat, give yourself a moment to get it in the pod because that really helps us keep that organized and get you the information you need. Um, what is a takeaway? And I would like to know how can you use that to shift your work or turn it into action? So I'm going to stop talking on purpose for a few moments and give people a chance to talk, uh, uh, think out loud or maybe in your brain, wherever the thinking takes place, and then give us a little bit of chat in the chat pod on a takeaway. And then we're going to open it up to Q&A and we're going to respond to those questions in the um, Q&A pod. Thanks. We've got a little reteach is helpful. We call it the redo rule in my own household. Let's redo. These are great. And I think, um, uh, Kelsey, probably we can move into Q&A because we've got some good ones in that pod and then folks can continue to add some really thoughtful things coming in here. Yeah, Jessica, just this is Susan just chiming in for a second while yeah. folks are populating the chat, the chat box. I was reflecting out as you were talking 
how um, our teams need to be focused on staff wellness as much as they are on helping to support students. And in that, um, when we talk about vulnerable decision points and being able to practice your neutralizing routine, I'm reflecting the need to have maybe a mindfulness room or a place where our teachers can go and just take a minute, have a mindfulness moment, practice their neutralizing routine, especially when they recognize in themselves that they might be extra tired or extra stressed. Um, and, and to be able, again, to create the system so the onus isn't on the individual, but it's a collective use of, of that. So it's being implemented consistently and um, we're supporting one another to, to, to invest in that, in that practice. And then looking at the data to reflect out to what extent and celebrate it, to what extent is this working, right? To what extent are we decreasing um, behaviors that, that are, are not wanted and, and, and using a different strategy uh, to employ? So thank yes. you for that offering. Well, I love, Susan, um, that the, the kind of refocus room is for teachers, mm-hmm. right? To, we're, we're ready to, to lean on the kids and say, kids, you make the decision to go to the refocus room. We're creating the environment, right? We're creating that environment. So then how do we resource that so teachers get breaks? Because I barely got to go to the bathroom when I was a teacher. How do we resource that and create that systematically to relieve and support one another in this work? Because we just continue to add and add and add without redesigning the system. And you're great at reminding us we have to redesign. So I think we can start taking some questions. I'm going to keep my camera off because clearly I was having some bandwidth issues. I've got a college kiddo in class upstairs, and I'm guessing that might have been why. Uh, so in the Q&A, we have a question from Elizabeth about legislators receiving this training and recognizing that bills so far do not reflect ISF thinking. And I think probably Kurt and I might be the best to to respond to that question. Um, And I can tell you that they're starting to receive information um, about interconnected systems framework. There is a a school behavioral health and suicide prevention subcommittee um, that started working this summer. And we've done some um, presentations to that group that includes legislators um, on ISF. Um, I know that on some work groups that Kurt has been on, um, they have talked about uh, ISF. Um, And I also think it's really important for legislators to hear um, from schools and districts on um, how this approach um, could be useful and helpful. And I think, uh, you know, if your district is willing to share that information, it's great for them to be hearing it um, from all sorts of people. So Kurt, do you have anything to add there? Uh, maybe just to underscore some of the things that you were talking about, there are certain legislators um, in Washington State, Sharon Tomiko Santos, she's a representative out of Seattle area, um, and she is chair of the House Ed Committee. Uh, we have conversations about ISF, um, and also Claire Wilson, who's a co-chair of education, she's a senator. Um, so part of it's just helping people understand what we're talking about when we say those words and what it can mean for as a systems approach. Um, so that that's kind of where things are at, but I know that they're having more and more conversations about it. So. Um, this is Jessica. I, I put a, a link in the chat as well. Um, that is Oregon Department of Ed's latest kind of um, description of mental health integration. That They're working hard at the Department of Education level to systematize and really um, clearly define what it looks like. Um, but as you all may know from working with different states um, or your own state, that's a slower process. So uh, but I love that focus in on our legislators. It's really important. Sorry, I recognized that Elizabeth is from Washington. So that's why I spoke directly to Washington. Thank you. That, for talking That about. works. We're balanced. We've even got California here right now. <laughs> we do. We do. So panelists, if you can see the questions, are there any additional that maybe we haven't answered? Um, Kelsey, I actually can't see the questions. I am clicking on the Q and A chat pod, but I can't bring it okay. up. I can see one. I can see them. I wanted to um, 
Andrew uh, asked a good question about assessment at each tier and how do we make sure they're using our assessment techniques that are equitable. So, and there are multiple levels of this. So we are going to assess our systems, right? Um, the, we have, and I'm putting some links in here, but I'll talk about it before I get it posted. The district system fidelity inventory, which is our new kind of newish district tool for our systems actually asks us how we shape that feedback from family community providers. And, and when we do that, do they actually show up? So we can start creating some metrics for accountability. Um, we also have in the tiered fidelity inventory, again, adult behavior shape, kiddo behaviors. We have a guide for a culturally responsive guide for how would we modify the work that we do to be more explicitly focused on being culturally responsive. And there's examples and non-examples which are helpful. And then Bradbury helpfully put some, uh, some, some tools later to some tools from the NCII, uh, which is really great. That's our National Int uh, Center for Intensive Interventions. That's very helpful. And at our, the, uh, from the kind of PBS center world, we would be again, looking at our, um, our outcome data disaggregated, our academics, attendance, um, our social emotional screeners, all the different things that we're interested in supporting in our kiddos. We're gonna look at those in a disaggregated manner and we have some guidance for those as well. So I'm gonna post some of those. I'm gonna give a big thanks to Brad for, for that thing, for that uh, call out as well. So Kurt, I see one from Ruth that maybe you could help answer. Um, she says she loves the idea of having people record themselves. Do you have any suggestions for non-threatening ways for school principals to help with this feedback to teachers? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's extraordinarily helpful feedback to do video recording. There might be some things to consider in advance of that. Uh, sometimes there's collective bargaining agreements that has some language that pertain to that, but I would pursue it uh, if possible. The other thing, obviously, to keep in mind is just the level of relationships and trust that is shared between the people in your setting. Um, but it's, it is worth it. And it's like watching game film. If, if you've ever done something like that, because it's just very revealing and helpful and takes a lot of judgment, uh, statements away from it. Um, so my recommendation is to obviously build that trust, those relationships, and then bring people around the situation. So we're all like in agreement. We're using similar vocabulary. We have an understanding of what looks and sounds like good practices, what, sh what should we be looking for? So as a principal, I did um, the same thing with classroom observations. Um, I would just go in with a video camera and I would particularly film or record student interactions with each other. Um, but um, what happened was then our, uh, my staff would get together themselves and critique each other in uh, trusting, helpful ways because we all knew what the look fors were. And then teachers got better and better at self-reflection and evaluating their own work, which is the best place for all of us to be. So then they were wanting to be uh, have a recording of their work so they could critique it and evaluate it and so on and so on. And then you just embed that into your culture um, but I took it, uh, I took the stance of this isn't going to be me critiquing and judging. I might be participating in it, recording myself and having us just ask ourselves questions against what we knew were the best practices. I love the watching film, Kurt. I'm going to seal that one now. That's a good one. And I'm also struck how so much of this is very restorative. And I'm using air quotes because we know that we can, some folks define this as, as, as more philosophical, but that self-reflection and how am I in this moment? What am I doing in this moment? Instead of thinking of office referrals or, or those other kind of metrics for teacher behaviors or something removed, it really does reflect where we are in that moment and it reflects the conditions under which we're working. It's, it's all, it's all interconnected there. So I like that. I like that reflection idea. I think it's really powerful. And I'm going to guess, and folks who know Kurt know that Kurt created a very positive, supportive environment where he wasn't running around saying these data stink. Um, so sometimes this people will say, how do we do this? We have to turn the, um, 
the ocean liner just two degrees at a time. Sometimes we can't change it overnight. It doesn't work like that. Ocean liners don't change that quickly and neither do systems. Systems don't change that directly. So there's an ongoing investment, which makes it even more important for it to be systematic or it's reliant upon the strength of Kurt as an individual and Susan as an individual. Let's hope they don't get tired and they just keep going, which is unreasonable of us to ask and is not making anyone well. I love, Kurt, how you, when you were talking about that, you created a safe space for teachers to be vulnerable and honest about where their strengths were and where they needed to focus areas of improvement. And I don't think a lot of us, um, I know in my first couple of years of teaching, I didn't get that safe space, right? And so we, we resort to um, things that, again, have these unintended negative consequences because we don't know um, what the evidence-based practices are. We, we don't have the opportunity to, to build um, our evidence-based practices because we're just learning um, by failing, <laughs> essentially. We're just trying to survive the system. So um, the administrative leadership piece is such a critical part in setting the stage and for teachers to, to be honest and, and have a process where we can um, get better in a feasible and realistic way. And, and our wellness is centered to that. So thank you for that. If I can right, add so just one more point to that because this can be such a powerful tool for learning for the system, your school system to learn. Um, um, try to focus on one aspect that you might want to improve and have that aspect um, be driven by either students giving input around how they perceive their experience in the school and or what the teachers are saying, because like Susan has said, and Jessica has said, this is all about adult behavior. So um, maybe you have some data that you're curious about that might lead you to say, friends, staff, what do we think about, what's the one thing that we could peel off and maybe focus on so when we're watching ourselves, we can narrow in on those things and critique ourselves and each other based on that. That will lead to hopefully some successes and quick wins and increasing our ability to do this work, to analyze our data. Awesome. Thank you three so much. I'm gonna now shift to share some really important resources. So I hope you hang in there with us. And while I'm talking through these resources and some new learning opportunities, I hope maybe you can put in the chat um, some, uh, express some gratitude uh, towards Kurt and Becca and Susan for the amazing presentation and resources and information that they provided for us to rethink whether or not um, our systems harm or help. So, I'm going to talk to resources, uh, share some kudos to them in the chat while I'm doing this. Um, here's just a few really excellent um, things we want to share with you. A wonderful plenary that Dr. Janine Jones gave on culturally responsive school mental health interventions. Um, I just highly recommend this. It was about 20 minutes. Um, I have watched it many times and keep learning new things. Uh, we have a MHTTC racial equity and cultural diversity resource page. Um, there is a presentation on um, reducing racial aggression disparities uh, via ISF aligned uh, discrimination intervention. Uh, we have some resources around a two part series we did this summer uh, that Kurt was involved with on supporting mental health in the context of racial violence, um, the PBIS Center has a culturally responsiveness field guide. And if you'd like more information um, on the interconnected systems framework and implementation guide, we have that website as well as the website from our partners um, that are helping with the practices side of these uh, of this series, uh, Trauma Aware Schools. A few really important upcoming learning opportunities uh, are UW Smart Center speaker series. Um, kicks off again in March with Ann Gregory. We have some additional really fantastic speakers through the rest of the year. Uh, Jessica and her team are putting on a virtual conference uh, at the end of February. There is an international conference for the Association for Beh Positive Behavior Supports uh, in mid-March. And um, the Pacific Southwest has um, School Mental Health Wednesdays every second Wednesday of the month. 
And then this is really exciting. We have a, a network-wide uh, initiative that we are doing around the National School Mental Health Curriculum. There are eight modules. Uh, registration is supposed to open today. I clicked on the link before the webinar and noticed they still have the save the dates up. So today or tomorrow, you should be able to register um, for these eight sessions and after. Um, each session, we're doing region, regional breakouts. If you are in the Pacific Southwest region, here is the contact information for that crew. If you are in Alaska, Oregon, Washington, or Idaho, you can reach out um, to us at the Northwest MHTTC. And if you're following along in the ISF webinar series, our next um, uh, session will be on Thursday, focusing on practices and then wrapping up with the ISF West Coast and Town Hall next week. So I think uh, my colleague Megan has put the uh, link to the evaluation. We hope that you'll take just a few moments uh, to complete those. Um, we highly value those and have a team that uh, creates these amazing evaluation summaries that helps us as a team make decisions about um, the type of support that we provide. So you should have the link to that. Again, you can access your certificate of um, completion and Washington in-service forms after finishing the evaluation. So I think with that, I will officially in the webinar, we'll leave it open if you're still trying to take information down um, from the chat or finishing the evaluation. And we wanna say thank you again to our presenters and thank you to participants taking time out of your day to, to be with us. So keep, I'm just going to keep waving. Like That's okay. I'm waving too. And it's, <laughs> it's a little silly, but I am, I am waving. I'm like the Barbie at the end of Toy Story. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. This is yeah. great. Thanks, everyone. Super.